one. Really cool. Okay. That was really good. I'd like to call this meeting to order. The uh, first order of business uh, is to go into closed meeting. Be it resolved, the Board of Supervisors hereby enters into closed meeting for the purpose of discussing the following. Discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or expansion of the existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facility in the community. That's project 2014-047. Discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, discipline, or resignation of specific officers, appointees, or employees of any public body. Economic Development Authority Planning District Commission. Discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or of the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position of the negoti negotiating strategy of the public body. And that will be uh, the former Blacksburg Middle School property. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second to go into closed meeting. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Cree? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Big? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven. We're in the closed meeting. Uh, Vicki? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our board meeting. Our first order of business is to uh, go out, of, need a motion to go out of closed session. Motion. Second. Have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. Certification of closed meeting. Whereas the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Whereas section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, Virginia hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies. And only such public business matters as were identified in the motion conveying the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Need a motion to. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second for certification of a closed meeting. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. B. Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. Our next order of business is our invocation. Uh, this is when we observe a moment of silence to reflect on the business at hand. And after that, we observe that, observe that moment of silence, we'll be led in the pledge by Mr. Meadows, our county administrator. please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Our next order of business is presentations, recognitions, and awards. But before we uh, go into that, I think Mr. Meadows would like to Thank you, introduce Brown. someone. I did want to take just a minute uh, early in the meeting and introduce a new uh, department head to you this evening. Emily, would you stand up? 
Emily Gibson is our new director of planning. Uh, been with us a little over a week now, and don't think we've drowned her too bad yet with challenges and opportunities. But Emily comes to us from Gloucester County, and very glad to have her on board. She comes very highly recommended. A lot of folks around the state uh, had a whole lot of good things to say about Emily, and even her county administrator gave her lots of compliments before she threatened my life but uh, <laughs> uh, we're glad to have Emily on board with us and I'm sure you'll be seeing more of her in the in the days ahead but Emily thank you for being here tonight I can say this uh, that if she's been here a week and still smiling like that <laughs> everything's okay <laughs> thank you mr. chair okay uh, we have a, a comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year ended June 30th, 2014. Hi. Means we got plenty of money. Good evening. I'm John Aldridge. It's good to see you all again this year. In front of you in your packet there, you should have a copy of the financial report, the bound document. It's a little bit easier to use that one than using the one that's PDF when we go through the page numbers. But uh, as you're aware, you really like that audit. And included in this audit is not only the county, it's the PSA, it's the Schools and Economic Development Authority. So they're all encompassed in this audit. I'm just going to walk you through a few items and again, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. In your packet there, if you would flip over to page number one, it's probably about actually 10 or 15 pages in, but it's page number one. It says Independent Auditor's Report. It's got the brown of this logo on the top. You want to focus in on the paragraph under where it says opinions. And it says, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above are present fairly in all material respects. What that means is you had an unmodified or a clean opinion on the financial report this year. So again, that's what you're shooting for. You have a clean opinion on the financial statements. All right, you flip a couple pages over to page 3A. You will note the management's discussion and analysis. The goal here is you can read these 10 or 12 pages and get a real flavor of what happened this year financially at the county. Um, so I would encourage you to look at those. And then if you worked over now to page number five, the statement of net position, or exhibit one. Just want to point a few things out to you on this statement. You'll notice there you have five columns. You've got governmental activities, that's primarily your general fund. You've got business type activities, that would be the water and wastewater. And then you notice you've got the school board column and economic development authority. Uh, these statements here, exhibit one, they're prepared on what's known as the accrual basis of accounting, just like any other business would present their financial statements. You, you show the debt, you show the assets, just like a business would, and you would see that on exhibit one. All right, then if you flip over two pages to page number seven, we have the governmental funds, and this is more what you're used to seeing. And you'll notice there the general fund shows up on Exhibit 3. And you had total assets in the general fund of a little over $48 million. Your liabilities were $9.5 million. And then you had what's left over as fund balance, and you can see the various categories there on Exhibit 3. Okay, two pages over. I want to point out on Exhibit 4, you have the statement of revenues, expenditures and changes in fund balance, the governmental funds. And on the first column there, the general column, I want to show you something. You'll notice your expenditures were $109 million in that category. Just want to remind you, in Virginia, debt that you issue for a school system, when you make payments on that debt, that shows up as your expenditure, okay? So out of that $109 million of expenditures, there's $18.4 million of school debt service. So what happens? You make the payment for them, it shows up in your uh, column there. So the asset and the debt show up on the counties even though they're school related because they can't issue debt. So again, out of that $109 million, 18.4 is the debt service on the school items. Okay, on page 11, you've got the budget actual statement. You can just compare how y'all did with the original budget and the final budget and compared that to actual. And this is on another basis of accounting. This is on the cash basis of accounting. So this is just the checkbook. It's no uh, 
No approval, nothing like that. This is just money coming in and money going out. It's a cash basis. All right, starting on page 13, we have the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position for proprietary funds. Again, this is your water and wastewater. They're viewed as a business type activity, meaning they're in business, there needs to be user fees in place to cover the cost of those activities. So they're set aside, unlike the general fund that's primarily tax money or money from the state or the federal government, these are user charges that are carrying those costs. All right, starting on page 15, we have the notes, and I'm not gonna to touch on every single one of them, but I do wanna talk about one in particular. If you go all the way to page 46, Page 46, and we'll look at the top of that page. Between now and next year, there's this new standard that's coming out. And what the standard says is you have to, to put in uh, easy terms, the VRS liability has to come on your books. And you have to reflect that as a liability, okay? In the past, that's only been a disclosure. It's been disclosed what your share of that is. But now the VRS is actually going to go on that Exhibit 1 we talked about, the accrual basis of accounting, and it will show up as a liability for you. And just to give you a sense of how large that number will be, if you look on page 46, the top section, you'll see there that, that third column over where it says uh, un underfunded, overfunded actuarial accrual liability. See that's $19.9 million. That's the amount that will show up for the county. Okay, that's in the ballpark. It's not going to be that number exactly, but that gives you kind of a sense of where it's going to be. And then if you look down in the school board section, you can see that number is $5.7 million. But don't stop there. It gets better. The number actually does not reflect. That's only the non-professional portion of the school. Okay, what's happened in the past, VRS has reflected your share of the professional employees on their books, and they've disclosed that. You've never had to disclose that, okay? Just to give you a sense, I pulled the, there's a report that the Virginia Retirement System put out. This is based on June 30, 2012 numbers. For Montgomery County School Board, the professional piece is $98 million, okay? So that liability will show up on the school's portion of this financial report. So again, approximately $20 million for the county, 5.7 for non-professional, then another approximately $100 million for the school's professional employees. This isn't gonna change how you do things day to day, okay? You, you're gonna continue to make the payments just like you always have. The only real change here is that liability, instead of being disclosed, it's reflected on your financial statements. All the bond agencies are aware of this, this isn't gonna surprise them. Every locality in the United States is going to have to do this next year, okay? But it's just something to be aware of. The thing for Virginia that's unique is the VRS piece on the professional teachers, that's never been disclosed before in your financial report, and now you're going to see that. And just to give you a sense, that same number for Fairfax County is right at $2.6 billion. Wow. So just to put that in perspective, and, and again, I've got the report. I'll leave with your financial... Uh, finance director, and so if you're ever interested in what other localities their share is going to be, it's all there. Okay, and then just a couple other things, and I'll answer any questions you have. On page 59, if you wanted to see the activity for the schools, it's back there on uh, exhibit A2. You've got the operating column, and then you've got the cafeteria that's shown separately there, and the various expenditures and revenues for them. On page 62, as part of your audit, we also have to look at the federal money that comes through the county. And if you'll see that on page 62 and 63, your federal expenditures were $9.4 million this year. So that's you know what's come through here, federal dollars. We have to test a certain percentage of that. And if you look at the last thing I'll mention on page 86, on page 86, item A7, you can see all the programs, federal programs we tested this year. And you'll find there the school breakfast, school lunch, temporary assistance to needy families, and you can work your way down. The good news is in testing all those programs, we had no findings at all. 
everyone, all the compliance steps were met, and so everybody was in compliance with those procedures. So uh, no findings at all. And also related to the state, there's certain tests that we have to do for the Auditor of Public Accounts, and there are no findings there also that are reflected in this report. So again, a good audit, a clean opinion, and no federal findings. And with that said, I will be happy to answer any questions y'all might have. Questions, comments? Go back to page one, please. <laughs> Go back to what, page one? No, I'm oh. just Ms. Perkins said she's going back to page one. We might be here a lot. <laughs> you were talking so fast, I couldn't even write it down. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any questions? Yeah. That's fine. I don't have any questions, really. I would like to get a copy of the VRS information. Yeah. That's something that we've talked about yes. on the VACO right. Finance Committee and I uh, know mm -hmm. the Education Committee has as well. But it, the good news, if there's good news, is everybody has to show that. It's not just us. And so, right. but it will put a ding in the balance sheet to be sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. All Ridge, right. uh, for thank coming you. up to share the good. report with us. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, let me ask this. Is it any action that we need to take on the, on the report? Okay. Moving right along. <laughs> we move into our public address portion of the meeting. I don't have anyone signed up to speak to the board tonight but if there's someone in the audience who would like to address the board at this time uh, they would have five minutes and direct all the uh, comments and to the board and uh, they'd have to state the name and address before they start so is there anyone who would like to address this board tonight at our public address session okay I'll close this part of our meeting and moving right along. Is an addendum today, Mr. Mr. Meadows, do we have an addendum? No, sir. No okay. addendum this evening. No addendum. Next item will be consent <coughs> agenda. Move approval. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion of any of the items on the uh, consent agenda? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gaines? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Big? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. In the work session, be it resolved, the Board of Supervisors hereby enters into work session for the purpose of discussing the following. Regional Tourism Program Update to Fiscal Year 16 Budget Revenue Estimates. Three, ban the box national movement to remove questions from employment application regarding criminal history. Need a motion? So moved. And second. a second? Second. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Big? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. We're in work session. Mr. Chair, the first item this evening is an update on our regional tourism efforts, and Lisa Bleakley is here to give us that report tonight. Lisa, always good to have you here with us. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Brown, Supervisors, Mr. Meadows. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to update you. Looking for the mouse. <laughs> to update you on the tourism efforts tonight. I believe that you have uh, in your packet the slides from the PowerPoint, and then I uh, equipped you with some additional information just for some light reading later on. <laughs> this way, okay. First slide, the way I thought I would tackle this tonight, because we have been hard at work for the better part of two years now. I came on board a few months into fiscal year 13, 2013, and uh, we're building a program pretty much from scratch. We had some monies there um, that was very nice to get started with, 
And so with this first slide, what this illustrates is those monies collected from the towns and the county in 2010 and 2012 and added to, actually, wait a minute, I've got ahead of myself. This first slide is actually shows travel expenditures. And I thought it'd be helpful to, to start with years 2011 and 2012. Those were the years preceding when I came in to begin developing this program in 2013. What you will see is the tourism spending is not our spending at this part. We're talking about the travelers' dollars when they're traveling around our area and they're spending. So in 2011, travel expenditures as reported by the State Tourism Office, um, as reported by U.S. Travel Association, they reported that we had $121.8 million spent in our county. In fiscal year 12, that increased to $129.4 million in travel expenditures. What I would like to point out here is <clears throat> the, we had a 6.2 uh, percent increase between 2011 and 2012, I believe it was. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can point to a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we hope that there's increased stays, there's increased uh, expenditure in travel dollars, all those sorts of things. But one thing that we can't ignore here is in those years, in 2012, uh, the town of Christiansburg had a tax increase in both occupancy tax, that's the taxes we collect in, from visitors in the hotels, and also meals tax. I show this because I did want to you know, not claim all the credit for that, but in 2013, you see that we're still rising in travel expenditures, and that was with tax rates remaining flat. So I just wanted to point that out, that there's many reasons for why travel expenditures are there, uh, but what we need to keep in mind is they're increasing, and that's the, that's the part of the, the bar that we want to be on. The next slide gets to what I was telling you before. Uh, this is a snapshot just showing you essentially what our uh, budget has looked like. The, that, those two years that I walked into with monies that had been collected that were just kind of sitting there waiting on the program to begin development was added to operating budget of which we estimate to be about $250,000 a year that again comes from 1% of the occupancy tax collected from both towns and the county. So currently we have make sure I'm saying this right. We have actually a little over half a million dollars. You'll see $486,047. Uh, we just got a check today from the town of Christiansburg for a little over 100000 for quarter one and two. So we have 593 and some odd change. Now that's on our total assets. On our expenditures in, in fiscal year 13, we spent 123,445, and you see how that breaks down. And then in fiscal year 14, and then our current year, fiscal year 15. What I'd like for you to take away from this slide is there is an association that uh, the travel industry, we get a lot of our best practices from, and their standard DMAI, destination marketing association industry their standard for expenditures for a DMO or destination marketing organization such as ours uh, we're pretty much in line with what those standards are they say that 25 to 50 percent of the budget should be spent on salaries 40 to 50 percent on outreach or marketing and that is the primary responsibility of a DMO and then 10 to 15 percent on overhead those things that it takes to, to make a business run basically what I would like to say here is the operating or the overhead expenditures have remained very low. In fiscal year 13, it's 9%, fiscal year 14, 5%, and then in our current year, we're at 2%. The thing that's not reflected in overhead is the, the assets, the resources that the county gives us. That's the office I have below, the utilities that goes into all that. So as we think and we plan forward for a visitor center, uh, those are budget items that we need to consider that are not captured now in expenditures. And just the benefit of working with this great group of people every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. 
So, you know, all those numbers, you can throw around a lot of numbers, and fortunately, we have a few dollars now to work with because we've been very methodical in building this program. We haven't thrown money to a lot of advertising and so forth until we get our game plan down. We're very close to that. I got off the uh, phone with the agency today, and we are very close to being able to share with you um, our marketing face, as it, as it were, for going forward and how we're going to promote ourselves to both our current visitor and hopefully new, new visitors in the future. So well, what this slide shows is all those numbers I talked about and the travel expenditures. Again, that's travel dollars being spent around our county in lots of different ways. Gassing up cars, restaurants, hotels, buying those miscellaneous in the different, you know, just retail establishments. I like to call this tax relief. Basically, it's revenue, this $230.40, uh, is here in our jurisdiction, in our locality, because of travel dollars. Mathematically, how that breaks down is <coughs> travelers in 2013, again as reported by U.S. Travel Association, spent eight million, over, blew over $8 million in state and county taxes. That's state and Montgomery County taxes. So you take 34,739 households in Montgomery County, do a little easy arithmetic, and not that we'll have a liberal check for each resident, but that's $230 that hopefully gives a little tax relief there through normal things that we do as a locality. Also, there's the intangibles, as in quality of life, facilities, all those sorts of things that our visitors enjoy, that we enjoy as residents also. So the marketing piece of that pie that I talked about, um, this slide is just to illustrate a little bit of the activity that we do with those marketing dollars. There, more and more as we go into the future, we're going to be focusing on that external market. Our customers are outside of this area. But because this is a new program and a really important part of our plan, the plan you guys signed off on in 2013, and a part, part of that was to build that local ambassadorship, that local pride in what we have here because there's no amount of advertising that I can do that would be more advantageous than word of mouth from friends and family and being very prideful in where they live and wanting people to visit. So we do um, a whole host of things in promoting our area, um, and we'll do more of that going forward. And this slide represents that promotion, those dollars that we spend putting into that engine to, to hopefully bring in more, you know, more folks maybe, or maybe the folks that are coming in, causing them to stay longer, spend more money, um, and then that, that results in jobs and um, more tax revenue, and that's why I understand that I have my position here, is to try to keep that going. You'll see I included, um, there's an association, the Virginia Hospitality and Travel Association, um, picked up on uh, that we are keeping these tourism numbers up here, and I only hope to see more of that type of PR as we go forward. So that's the end of the presentation, but also in your packet, I like to go back to this plan. Uh, I've always been a big proponent of plans aren't made to sit on the shelf. A lot of good people put in hard work uh, and time into this plan. So what you have, and I won't go over it uh, in detail, but I'm open to any questions as we either tonight or later. I took the five goals that we established as a community on what's important for this tourism program. You'll see objectives there as well, and then the progress to date and some of the things that we have on the horizon. One of the things out of uh, the goal of improving tourism infrastructure, Mr. Meadows, you have the maps, the tear-off maps in front of you. There should be enough for everyone there. Uh, we have a beta version right now out at the front desk of hotels, select hotels. Uh, the, we've gone through many eyes so far to make sure that we have represented what we need to have represented for the traveler. There will be an interactive component of this on our website that is also currently being um, developed. But if you know, all of us have been in hotels and you need to know where to get from point A to point B and that front desk clerk needs a tool to 
used. And this was one of the things that they asked for. Uh, fortunately, we have some awesome mapping folks in the county. We have some awesome graphics artists, public information folks that have helped me put this together. I'm still asking for, through this, this testing period, and we're doing it for two months, asking for feedback. You see on the front, there's an overview of the county, and on the back, it shows both towns. Um, so if you are staying in Blacksburg and you're going to the Christiansburg Aquatic Center, you can see that linkage now. So it's not the final product, but it is the beta version, and I welcome any input. We have stopped short of putting a lot of private uh, businesses there because that opens a whole Pandora's box. Hotels, lodging, that's a no-brainer. We have to have that on there. But restaurants, you know, specific retail, maybe that's something that we can add to the interactive component because that's much easier to keep up to date for the user. So that is one of the tangible items we identified a need for in our plan and we have almost seen that to completion and that will be an ever you know, evolving kind of thing as we develop um, our destination. And I mentioned that our branding campaign, uh, or I mean our brand development, that is, that's taking the lion's share of work right now and we're very soon to completing that and working on a visitor guide, our website, collecting images and all the copy that goes into that. Again, we have started a program from scratch. So, um, taking a lot of time to develop partnerships and all those things that we identified, this should bring you up to date, this document. So with that, are there any questions now or anything that you know, you've wondered about that I could help shed some light on? Thank you. Questions, comments. I noticed our new planning director lit up when you made the comment about plans aren't made to put on a shelf. <laughs> I know that Lisa has worked really hard uh, to take the information that was developed as part of that plan and start putting feet under it, as I call it. And and I can't express enough how much. I appreciate the work that she's done to go out and build partnerships because one of the key things as we move forward with, with tourism is to make sure that all the partners in the community are on board. And that's not an easy task sometimes and uh, Lisa's worked really hard to to be out doing that and building that and um, made for a lot of busy weekends too, I know. Well, I, I would personally like the map. I know that there's a lot of people now with GPS, but there's still people my age and older who don't use GPS, don't use the phones, and they want a map, and to be able to pick it up is, is a good thing. So That's one of the most requested items downstairs, is a good physical map. Yeah, I remember that this summer when we tried to help the gentleman out, remember, That's right. that was looking? You were really an asset that day mm -hmm. to him. Ah. Echo Mr. Meadows' sentiments. Uh, I'm over here a, 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 a few nights a week and, and a few evenings, and every time I come to the door, whether it's 6 30, 7 o'clock, there's Lisa in there, and she, because I always ask her, Don't you ever go home? <laughs> you know, but see, I got these ideals, I got to get them out. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're very dedicated and uh, to what you do, and you take a whole lot of pride in doing it right, so to speak. Uh, oh, only if we had, uh, you know, two or three hundred employees like you, mm -hmm. you know, we get a whole lot of stuff done because they'd be here six thirty, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, you know, doing what they need to do. Filling daggers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I appreciate it. This is very important, all joking aside, and so I mean, any time I spend, it's it's an important thing. So thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we got some find out about the money, I guess, next, right? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Next item under work session is an update on the fiscal year 2016 budget and our best guesses as to revenue right now, although Mark doesn't like it when I say guesses because he's pretty precise. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Angie. All right. 
Because I'm sure his numbers are, are right because Angie's behind him checking and make sure the question. And Carol's behind all of us checking. Thank you. Thank you. I can this with See if I don't think he wants it. Good evening. My name is Mark Maruder. I'm the county's budget manager, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our upcoming budget. I'm going to give you a little background. Um, as you know, county revenue falls into two separate categories, undesignated revenue and designated revenue. The undesignated portion of our revenues are unrestricted revenues, which means that you can pretty much use those for any purpose. On the other hand, you have designated revenues, which are restricted. They're earmarked for a specific purpose and then can only be used for that purpose. Uh, just to talk a little bit about how things have changed. In the past, when I started here 11 years ago, it was about an 80-20 split. In other words, the undesignated portion of your revenue made up about 80% and the designated piece made up about 20%. Over the last 11 years, that's switched to about 88% undesignated and about 12% designated. And the reason for that is, is the state continues to cut aid to localities. And as a result of that, you guys are picking up the tab with additional undesignated revenue. There's basically um, three categories of revenue on our undesignated piece that drive 95% of all of our revenue. And that's real estate, personal property, and sales tax. trying to give you the big picture about our growth pattern for fiscal year 16. Normal growth pattern that we've seen over the last 10 or 12 years has been about $1 million to $2 million per year. Excluding the impact of the 2015 reassessment, again, calendar year 2015 is the reassessment year and we're in the process of evaluating how things are going through that process. Based on where we are at this point, we're looking at about $1.2 million in growth. You can see the real estate makes about $400,000 of that. Personal property motor vehicles makes up about $700,000. Other current property, which would be other categories of, of personal property, makes up about $300,000. Sales tax, $200,000. And the big issues this year are really uh, the recordation tax, which is down about $300,000 in a few other categories. You add all that together, you're at $1.2 million. And I'm going to talk a little bit about recordation, what's going on there. Basically, the recordation tax is a tax that is imposed on deeds and mortgages when people buy and sell real estate. And so what two things are going on. The first thing is that because of the low interest rate environment that we were in, there was a huge rush for people to go out and refinance. And when they went out and refinanced, we tagged them with a recordation tax on top of their refinance. So because of that craze that was going on, there was a lot of money coming in under recordation. That's starting to dwindle, so we're not getting that. On top of that, as interest rates are rising, there are less people going out buying new homes, and so you're seeing a double effect of less recordation, both from the refinancing craze going away and the fact that people are not buying as many new homes now as interest rates are starting to rise. So it's almost like we're getting hit twice on that, and that's why I'm down significantly in that particular category of revenue. Talk a little bit about reassessment. The real estate numbers that you will see on the next couple of slides are based on a revenue neutral real estate rate. Uh, the Board of Equalization will be holding hearings over the next few weeks. We'll get finalized numbers generally about the first week of March. And then we will provide you uh, final revenue projections, which would provide also a revenue neutral real estate rate with the reassessment in the proposed budget um, March 9th. Our revenue going forward, current growth patterns, again, are very similar to prior years. We're looking at $1.2 million in growth. Last year, when I presented preliminary revenue projections, we were at $1 million in growth. And what we've seen over the last few years, the county's experienced and continues to experience less construction growth, swings in motor vehicle valuation. We saw that last year. And again, 
recreation swings. So, you know, as things change in the environment, and we're dealing with them on the back end. To help, to help balance the budget, we've eliminated and froze positions. We've deferred operating requests. We've maximized our revenue projections. I want to hit on that a little bit. Last year, when we presented the revenue for 2014, we were within $166,000 on $95 million. That's 17 one-hundredths of 1%. One percent. So that's how close our revenue has been to the actual number. And we yes. talked about you need to do better this year. So. <laughs> well, that's good. But I, the point is, is that you know, we're tight. really trying to provide you with as accurate a prediction of where we think we're going as possible. And when we go back and look at how we've done, we've done very well as far as predicting where we thought we would be. We, uh, in order to generate some additional revenues, we eliminated the revenue stabilization fund. We changed the method in which we uh, evaluate uh, motor vehicle personal property, and we've increased tax rates. This next slide shows a breakdown of our revenue by individual category. As you can see, the growth is in our motor vehicles and real estate. And then on the next page, you'll see that that recordation is drawing us down. And so you get $1.2 million in total growth in undesignated revenue. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the governor's budget. According to the schools, the additional state revenue that they anticipate receiving is around $64,000, and that excludes uh, $213,000 for the e backpack initiative. Over the last few years, we've been dealing with state cuts, and we're still dealing with those. The state flexible cuts are back for fiscal year 15 and 16. They were eliminated, but then the state couldn't figure out how to deal with some of their own revenue issues, so they pushed it back on localities. The impact to the county for fiscal year 15 and 16 is around $160,000. The governor's budget also includes funds to support increasing the compensation board's entry-level salaries for deputy positions. We're going to receive about $20,000 in revenue from that. But because of the county's existing salary levels are significantly higher than what the compensation board would pay, that becomes a revenue for us. And I've put down here what we're currently paying for an entry-level deputy position, what the compensation board would pay for, and how much of a salary supplement we are actually providing on that. So you can see that uh, an entry-level deputy is making $35,000 if they work for the county, if they were receiving compensation board funding and we, they were only on that supplement, they'd only receive uh, 31000 So the county's entry salary is around $4,000 or 14% higher than what the state would pay. The governor's budget also includes additional funding to replace voting machines statewide. It's $29.6 million statewide. The General Assembly would have to approve this initiative in, for, in, in any way for the county to receive the money. Over the last three years, the county's committed to a three-year replacement program to address voting machines. We've provided $78,000 in fiscal year 14 and 15 for a total of $156,000 of that. We still have $78,000 in the base budget to address the third year. Um, so far, $143,000 has been spent to date, 24 machines have been purchased, and we're on schedule for an additional 12 machines, which are planned to be purchased in fiscal year 16, and will address all of the registrar's needs as far as uh, voting machines are concerned. Next steps. We'll continue to analyze budget requests as are re received. Presentation of the proposed school budget will be on February 9th. The county's budget will be presented on March 9th. Uh, on March 23rd, we'll need to establish a tax rate uh, and budget. There will be a public hearing on the tax rate and budget on April 9th. And then hopefully we can adopt the budget and tax rate on April 20th. Yeah, and I was going to point out, Mark, on, on March 23rd, we just, as we've discussed, we just need to determine what the board wants to advertise for a tax rate and budget. We do not set the budget that night. We advertise, and then we have further discussion. But and that completes my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions you all might have. 
Questions? Let's comment. Comment. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the citizens knew that we had addressed the state flexible cuts with our General Assembly members when they came for a legislative dinner and told them that that was something that we would like to not to see happen. We'd only had one year of relief from that in recent years. And we also talked about the compensation board and, and how um, that is affecting us. And we talked about public safety. We've talked about all these things with our General Assembly members. And, and if citizens um, want to help in any way, these are the kinds of things that they need to hear because we're paying for them here. And less and less is coming from the state to pay for these services. And that includes, of course, public education big time. But these are the things that affect us and we've all felt the economy, just like you've been talking about the growth money, but yet we are still asked over and over to somehow come up with money to pay for these things. So I think that um, that's still a very serious um, issue in the state of Virginia in regards to who pays for what and, and how things are being paid for. And we will be going to lobby day next Wednesday. Yep. So I'll hear it again. Um, in regards to the voting machines, considering the budget for the entire state is 29.6, is it fair to say that even if we get a chunk of that money, it's going to be a small amount? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how it would be um, divvied out, so to speak. Um, but, I mean, if there is a reimbursement, my understanding is going to be on, on a reimbursement type basis. So the fact that we've already purchased these shouldn't hurt us. Okay. Um, and so we should, if the money is available, then it could be applied towards that reimbursement. Thank you. Um, and it, and yeah, yeah. When you list the uh, additional state funding for schools, um, is that the total amount that they're going to get out of whatever? Uh, according to the schools, they the amount that they're supposed to get is $64,000. And that excludes that e-backpack initiative, yeah. which my understanding was it's a choice for them whether or not they want to participate in that. So if you add that together, I think the, it would be around 300 some thousand. For everything. But for operating expenses, for operating it's expenses. really $64,000, right. correct? Okay. Right, that's what I'm getting at. And that's just additional funds from last year? That's additional over the existing budget. Budget. Mm -hmm. Not very much, is it? Mm -hmm. Not in a $91 million budget. Budget, absolutely when we need so much more than that. Well, uh, <coughs> Mr. Magruder, I think we're good. Okay. And, uh, right, thank you. Thanks. We'll be seeing appreciate a lot more uh, Mark and Angie in the weeks yeah, ahead. Yeah. Appreciate uh, you and Angie coming and sharing your time with us. Next subject. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, the last item under work session this evening is a continuation of the discussion of the Ban the Box um, initiative. We talked about this in a work session, I believe a meeting or so ago, as far as uh, concerns about including uh, the box on our employment applications that indicates whether someone has been convicted of a felony or not. and. I know there was discussion among the board members about how to proceed, but we never really came to a consensus. I don't believe we came to any consensus during that discussion as to how you would like us to move forward with that. So we added that back to the agenda tonight for um, further discussion among the board and hopefully seeking some direction. I just wanted to, to recapture something I believe we talked about when we had that last discussion is that um, if we were to remove that box from all applications, anyone who is hired by the, the county still has to undergo a criminal background check before they are actually hired. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Then I'd like to move forward and remove that the box from <coughs> county applications as soon as possible. And, and 
I, I would support that, but there was some discussion about whether we would require everyone who does business with the county then to remove the box. I would be in favor of the county removing the box, but not requiring businesses <coughs> that do business with the county to remove the box. I, I don't, and for me, I, I don't like telling other people how to run their businesses. That's their decision. And then we can decide that we're going to run a criminal background check on every single person that, that we're going to hire. But I, I don't feel right about telling other businesses to do that. Comments? The only thing I got is I'm just afraid that if we take it off, some people will have false hope getting a job and then come find out they're a convicted felon. That's the only thing I got. I mean, I'm in support of taking it off, but that's the only concern I have. Well, and, and the, the process that we go through, um, the background check isn't run on every applicant. It's run on the applicants that get to a point in the process that we may offer a position. So if somebody gets through the process and they're offered a position and then that shows up on a background check, that'll certainly be an opportunity to sit down at the table to have a discussion about that issue. Would it automatically disqualify them? No, it wouldn't. So. Um, I, I, I've got some questions. And, is that on? Yeah. Yes, I can hear. And my questions, I am not against banning the box. My problem is, is in where I agree with Chris as far as uh, banning them only for what we have control over here. I don't think we should throw our weight around into uh, another jurisdiction or another. Uh, but the question I have as I was hearing what everybody was saying is what happens if you get so far away from banning the box that nobody ends up banning the box, even here. And then six months after you have hired someone, you didn't ask that question, and you come to find out they are a uh, triple or uh, whatever uh, child molester. It's not their fault because you didn't ask, but at the same time, do we want someone who's three, four, five times felons down the road? That is what I don't understand. But for me, that's the HR person's job, and if they <laughs> fail at that job, then yes, we're going to dismiss the person who is a, a registered sex offender. Because if you molested three children in Virginia, you're going to have to register as a sex offender. But frankly, then I'm going to be looking at Craig and saying, we have a serious problem in HR, and, and you need to address this because right. we have endangered our citizens by hiring somebody like that. And they should have well, gone to background check. Well, and, I, and, that, and I'm, I'm looking at Marty and Carol, too. It's, to the best yeah. of my knowledge, when we make an offer for any position, we run a criminal background check, do we not? Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's what I thought. So it would it would come. So you're, you're saying that will not change. No, no, sorry. no, 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 absolutely not. No, that won't no, that's that's to protect that's to protect the county and to protect the citizens. Just as a final check, when we make an offer of a position, to make sure there isn't anything just hiding out there. You know, when we do that, when we've done that in the past, we find you know occasionally we'll find an old DUI offense. We find things that we then sit down with the finalist and say look we need to talk about this before you become a county employee yeah. um, okay, that, that was my <laughs> question okay well I was just gonna say I remember the the young the gentleman that came here when this was presented to us I think you know it provides the person an opportunity like 
you know, if, if you don't have the box on there, okay, and let's say that they have done something in their past, but then they get to the interview process because they haven't had to check the box, but they get to the interview process, that also gives that individual a chance to be honest with his or her background before it ever gets to the background check. And um, I think that says a lot for individual if, you know, they come to the interview process, they really want a chance at having a job and they're, and they're willing, straightforward and honest and to say, you know, you probably need to know that. Right. That, you know, I think that says a lot, but this gives that person an opportunity to get to the place of having the interview. So it's an additional step that they might not have gotten. And I think that's where I'm coming from. I see that as an important, um, something important to give give a chance or give an opportunity um, especially you know like in America we're supposed to like you know you do the crime you pay, you pay the time you do your time okay now does that mean that you're doing the time for the rest of your life or does that mean that once you've completed your you know punishment you can come back out and try to be a productive citizen and I think that taking the box out gives a person a chance to do that. That's the way I see it. I'll just follow up on what Ms. Biggs said because that's where I was going to. I can remember very distinctly interviewing a young man for a position. We got to the point where we said um, we would like, we will do a back, um, you know, should you be the candidate, we will do a background check. <coughs> and. This young man said, well, then you might have some misgivings because he came and told us exactly why he had this on his record, how it happened. Um, he was not involved in that situation anymore. Uh, he, he talked very honestly and very openly and it did give him an opportunity to tell us what exactly he had done and been through when we would do the background check. And so, as far as I'm concerned, the checking of the boxes is not really the critical part. I mean, that's off. He can come and have another chance to talk to us right at that point. Then, if we decide he really is the person we want, regardless uh, after talking to him, then the administrator and others will sit down and have another discussion with him or her uh, as they are uh, looking and maybe working in a particular job. So um, I'm very much in favor of banning the box because I know what, and I have seen it happen in interviews that we've had in the past here for the county. And most of the time the people have been very honest uh, in fact, all the time that I've done one, they've been pretty honest with us. Okay, Mr. Gray. One, one other question. One question leads to another sometime. <laughs> if someone is on our uh, member of, of, of the whole county and they commit something, whether it be a drunk driving or whether it be, uh, you know, whatever it may be, or, uh, anything that I mean, they could possibly put a full time on, maybe a good lawyer, but it could get them off or whatever it may be. Help establish their innocence, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, like what, a true lawyer. What, what is our outlook on, well, what, is it now and or will it be the same? Our personnel policy states that if an employee is convicted of an offense, they're supposed to report that to the county. If they're charged. Thank you. Yeah, yes, if they're charged with an offense, they're supposed to report that to the county. Now, do we have background? Do we have checks to make sure that always happens? No. But if they don't report it and they're found out, then that's a much more severe penalty than would be had they just simply reported it. Yeah. <coughs> so have you, you got double? Uh, which one's on the top? Which one's on the bottom? Well, I guess you know one of the 
one of the benefits, I guess you could call it, of living in a smaller community is most of the time if a, if a, any employer citizen is charged with a certain level of offense, you hear about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially having a board member who's in the courthouse quite often and <laughs> having there a... There is that publication called Crime Time. So well, <laughs> put put folks, get out there in, in the week of your book. Yeah, it's, well, it's it, hard to hide those type of offenses anymore in this era of uh, openness and, and, and public information. Um, but you're right, as an existing employee could commit a crime and it not get reported. But the ban in the box won't affect them one way or the other. It's, it's but even if it is reported, if you're letting other folks who are just now coming in to ask for a job yeah. get by with what they have done, do you owe this other fellow that just, or lady, or whoever it may be, uh, do you owe them a shot, uh, a second shot at their job? I think well, that the personnel has to consider yeah. what that yeah. is. What mm -hmm. if it is a, a drunken public charge because they drank too much over a tech game and, and, and got arrested? Well, you might not, you might have some counseling, you might work with that employee. Well, and the key thing there too, and I'll reiterate that because we've had some examples of that, if, if the employee comes clean and comes in on Monday after a bad weekend and admits to the department head or supervisor, yes, I've been charged with this, then that's one thing. It's another thing if they don't say anything and then they're convicted. As far as I'm concerned, that's a terminal offense because they've not only not followed the personnel policy in reporting it, they've now been convicted and, and that's a little bit of a different situation. Um, I can tell you I there have been not quite a few, but there have been several self-reported incidents over the last couple of years even when somebody knows they're innocent and but they've been charged and that happens sometimes in domestic situations um, I, I some if someone comes in to interview and has committed an offense we're going to look at I mean been charged or, or uh, convicted on a certain offense we're going to look at what they did how long ago it was circumstances of the job they do we're going to do the same thing when some an employee comes in and says, hey, I just got charged with a certain offense. Depending on how serious that offense is, that they may be suspended right away. They right. may be suspended with, with pay, depending on what happens because of the, the seriousness of it. If it's not something as serious, they'll be dealt with differently. But you would hope you deal with the same those, those two instances similar, meaning you may not hire somebody because you find out what their offense was. At the same time, that offense may get someone fired. Right. Who did it here as an employee? So they're, they're going to be treated pretty equally, I would think. But that it's makes sense. also true that we have me. jobs within the county that uh, there are no tolerance for. Well, there, there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No, that there's no tolerance. That's right. Anything that. You know, well, if you're, if you're an equipment operator and you're convicted yeah. of DUI, then you can't so be an equipment truck operator. Right. Or equipment right. Operator right. Or whatever it might be. Or you pass it, you fail a drug test, you're going to let go. Or if you're yeah. working with children in or any or way, shape, or form. Or you're a law enforcement officer mm -hmm. and you're charged with a crime. Uh -huh. um, you, you could be suspended or well, terminated. Well, if you have the same person coming off of a drug-related problem and you get to the last thing, and this is the uh, head over hill, the best applicant you've had all day, and you really want one. Uh, do you look at them any different than you would somebody that's already? No, here? no, you don't. You, to me, you can't. No, you don't. So that, that takes away. Well, I, and I think that's what Marty's trying to say too. I don't, I don't see that being any different if, if, if an if if an applicant came in and and we've had those that have had DUIs that were 10, 15 years ago, but it comes up in the discussion and they're clean and they've not had a charge and they understand that if they get a subsequent charge, once they become an employee, that's not going to be tolerated, then they're okay. Same thing if we have a current employee that gets a DUI. I mean, they, an applicant that get, reaches that level and finds it and we find out things in a background is not going to be treated any differently than a current employee if they get into similar situations. Now, some of our folks now, they don't have to do another one. They have, can get kicked out on, on the first one they did. 
Yes, sir. It, it, depend, it depends on the responsibilities of the job. But that being said, neither would an applicant for that job, should they be found having some of those issues, they wouldn't be hired either. It'd be consistent. That's what I'm you okay, that's good matter. Can I bring us back to the fan the box question? Yeah. Um, what would be required of the board in order to enact this this policy change? Just consensus. Just consensus. Just well, con actually, I'd recommend when we come oh. out of work session, just pass a resolution authorizing the administrator to take administrative action to ban the box off all county. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and before I guess we go out of work session, is there a consensus that we are not going to require private entities that do business with the county? I agree. I agree with uh, Madden said anything much, but uh, when I think about band the box, I think about a, a, a 50 year old who comes in and apply who was convicted 30 years ago of marijuana possession. And you know, 30 years ago, a little bit of marijuana was like a major felony. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a major crime. People hadn't seen it before. They go to jail. Yeah, they go to jail and stuff like this. But you, 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 you got convicted when you was 18. You've had a pretty decent life so far and everything you apply for a job and you got to mark that box even if it's 30 years old and it's on there right. you got to mark that box but if the and box you've is served not there your time. yeah and the, if the box is not there at least it gets me an interview it gets me an opportunity to say yeah in uh, 1973 I was convicted of possession of, of marijuana and uh, received this, that, and that, and everything. Uh, but that's something that the person get an opportunity to talk about, a 30-year-old conviction. And uh, where, that if it was, yeah, last week when I was filling out the application, I got, you know, had a conviction, you know, something like that. So there's some things you weigh in. I also agree with, with uh, Chris. Like, for example, I know Mr. Allridge's company wouldn't have a felon working in their office or a criminal and things like this, but they do business with the county. And it's almost putting a restriction on how we're going to tell private entities how to manage and run their company. So I don't think that, I don't believe that we ought to say, if you're going to do business <coughs> with Montgomery County, you have to uh, ban the box on your application. So I'll, I'll agree. Uh, with that, uh, Chris, that we yeah. proceed to, uh, if we have consensus, we uh, proceed to the provisions to uh, man the box. So, uh, before we get too deep in concessions, Just I mean, one in, quick question. okay. Now, if this goes through, does that include volunteer departments here in the county? Like volunteer fire departments. Yeah. No, they or manage rescue either one. Rescue. They manage their own departments if I'm not correct. I mean we don't we manage don't okay. Uh, okay. we don't manage who becomes a fireman, who becomes a rescue squad and whatever rules that like Ron have, mm -hmm. they are their rules. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, good yeah. Point. Would they have to um, comply with the county personnel <coughs> policies? They don't. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Because I know that there are people, I know a young man, for instance, who realized that he had to check the box and he wouldn't even apply for the job. And he was quite capable of doing it. But, um, and there was a drug conviction of quite a few years before. And he just said, I know they won't hire me. And so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but <clears throat> I agree. Well, I, don't, I, I can't tell a private. Yeah. business operator how to do his job just I think it's what's important is those private businesses look at us and mm -hmm. see that we have removed <laughs> ban yeah. the box yeah. from our applications and so that may make a statement to them that hey maybe we ought to be doing yeah, something when you, similar. When you stretch that in that uh, we get uh, lunches from businesses and sometimes the, the people that work in those businesses are the mo not the most favorable people in the world but that's the only job they can get but if we for a work session or something we, we buy meals from this place are we going to tell that place because they do business with the county you know it can be a little bit of business or a whole lot of business that uh, say, well, well, since you got so-and-so and he was convicted of crime working there, uh, we can't do business with you. And how can we prove it anyway? I mean... There are, and today, because of the situation we have with uh, many businesses 
who uh, will use um, uh, immigrant uh, employees, okay. there's no way to be checking those from our point of view. Yeah. Well, they're we, legal or illegal, yeah, depending on Right, <laughs> whether well, they got a green card or not. Yeah. You know, that's up to that business to, to determine it. But I still think if we ban the box, that sends a message that we want people to. I don't know if it's given a second chance or just not have to start out with that, but get to that as we uh, determine whether or not they're really um, fit for the job. Do we have consensus to proceed to ban the box? Okay, <laughs> yes. unanimous. Okay. Uh, any more comments before we go out of work session? Well, does that that means they you will work on the policy to get that done, Is that, yeah. and we'll come back with. Yeah, he's got direction. Right. Okay. And I, I think it was good that the group came forward and presented to us right. the information, and two of them are in the audience tonight. So, right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Appreciate all you said. You dropped a note on the ground. Okay. okay. So, uh, Mark, okay. you suggested we have a resolution oh, yeah. out of work session. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could we do that immediately after? Should we wait until the meeting? Immediately after. Okay. Need a motion. Got a work session. So, so moved. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Cree? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven you got a. Uh, I'd like to a resolution, yeah. Offer or suggest a resolution for the board to pass to um, direct the county administrator to enact policy banning the box on all county applications. Second. I have a mo motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Freed? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. <laughs> so it will be done. Okay. New business. Subject A. Amendment to the EDA bond and agreeing that the support agreement shall remain in effect during the remainder of the bond technology manufacturing building. Mr. Chair, this is an item related to the technology manufacturing building, an opportunity to um, extend the maturity date on the uh, loan from 2015 to 2020. Uh, this will amortize the loan over 20 years. It allows us to reduce the interest rate from 3.75 to 3.4 percent. Also lowers the monthly payment. Uh, the two tenants that are currently in the technology building, uh, the revenues from those tenants will more than offset the, the debt on the building and in addition to the operating expenses. We did include a tab in uh, tab C for your information to show the comparison of the current financing to the new financing. Um, this was, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but we were required to refinance the, the note in January anyway, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. So one of the things we worked hard on over the last year, as you're well aware, is to get two long-term tenants in the building to help provide the cash flow to cover this debt. Okay, need a Where is that located in here? It's on State Street. It's. Um, it's in the black, oh, I'm sorry, the building or the tab? <laughs> the tab is tab C. C. Yes, sir. This is a fun thing I got here. Sometimes. Todd's doing well, I think, a uh, year or so ago. He couldn't even turn an iPad on. Now he's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The blind leading the blind, right? <laughs> okay, you got it here. Yeah, I've got it here. Okay. The other thing I'll point out about <clears throat> this refinancing as well is it does allow us to re refinance at any time in the future if we desire, but. Um, right now, this will allow us to, to move forward with a, with a slightly lower monthly payment um, that will be fully covered by the two tenants in the building. What, how much are we setting aside when we do this on a monthly basis? Or? I believe 5000 a month. Uh, I was going to say I think it's, I thought it was six, but after debt service, after operating expenses um, are all considered. Um, 
there's net revenue of about five to six thousand a month over and above all the expenses on that building so over and above all expenses on that all right building? yes sir i don't are we sure of that that's are we sure of that that's what it says right here uh, <coughs> please it's in print it must be right yeah. Yeah. No, no, don't don't believe that. <laughs> Hello, Brian Hamilton, um, no. Cumberland County Economic Development Director. Um, this refinancing is allowing the county to, or the Economic Development Authority, to lower the rate. And after our revenue of approximately seventy-one thousand dollars a month, uh, less our expenses and debt service, our positive cash flow is approximately five thousand dollars a month, or fifty-nine thousand dollars a year. So that is the amount that after repairs, debt service, all expenses, the positive revenue. There's nothing that could upset that ball card. Uh, well, there's always something that could upset that uh, ball <laughs> yeah. card. I think the schools have come several times with those types of issues, but you know, we continue to um, pay, you know, pay the debt service, keep the building in good repair, and take care of any um, issues that arise. The advantage of the securing the two new tenants this year is the building essentially received a entire facelift right. uh, on the interior. So, uh, brand new offices, brand new labs, um, brand new heating and air conditioning units. And so, while not everything, not how long is uh, the, the roof not now? Well, the roof is a twelve years, so twenty approximately had a ten-year warranty. So we've probably got about eight years before we have to replace it. And we, and we are very proactive on that roof. If anything happens, we fix it. But this refinancing saves about $7,500 a month. Is that correct? Am I yes, doing my does. math right? Okay. Yes, sir. In cash flow, yes, it does. I mean, cash flow. Yes, yeah. it's, yeah. It's just like getting home. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is. It, it, it's still a lot of debt, and we would like very hard to work that debt down. But it's just like if you have a home that you're trying to get a tenant in, sometimes you have to spend money on improvements to right. get a tenant in to continue the cash flow. And that's you do, but you know, we, that building over there has been a thorn. Yes, sir. In our side since it's been over there, and uh, that right. we're very we're very was hopeful one of the that first things I did was to go to that. Yes, ma'am. We're very hopeful that. Perhaps a tenant in the future will be interested in staying there long term. And hopefully, buy it. Well, that's, well, yes. <laughs> if you'll notice, if, um, this, through the next five years, it pays down $1.9 million in additional principal. So we can, we'll continue to pay down the additional principal. And like with any home that you're underwater on, that's the only way to make up the difference is secure tenants, pay down principal and interest. Right. Market's right, sell it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other comments? Need a motion. So, a motion. so moved. I have a motion and a second. Uh, <laughs> would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. King? Aye. Ms. B? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gable? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. Subject B request the General Assembly to grant the authority to impose a local tax on cigarettes. Mr. Chair, this is an item that um, I know that Delegate Yost is carrying uh, for Pulaski and Montgomery County. I also know there's several other bills in the General Assembly on this issue this year and we've been asked if we um, are interested in Seeing that happen, a, a resolution to that effect supporting it would be much appreciated. Move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Fitz? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Mr. King? No. Chair Brown? Aye. Six ayes, one no. And so, we, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say that probably it would not bring that much revenue into the county because most of the places that sell cigarettes are in the two towns and they collect their own tax. Just so everybody knows, it's not going to be a whopping amount. 
Well, but if you look, there's a lot of the folks who are selling cigarettes now, they're trying to move just outside the town limits to be mm -hmm. able to sell cigarettes uh, because of the difference in the tax mm -hmm. rates. So, But just remember where most are located. Yeah. <laughs> Even if they uh, uh, allow us to collect uh, uh, levy taxes on cigarettes, would it be a ceiling imposed uh, sure. that where we could match what they're doing in a town versus so it wouldn't be advantageous to leave the town to go into county back and forth? Did one of the didn't the I have read all the bills, but I know Carol's looked on. Wasn't there some limit as to how much you could charge? Then yeah, that's what. Oh. Yeah. Mm. It, it would almost, it would almost make you want to go out and recruit some smokers if you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You pay for it no. on the other end, though. Yeah, pay for it on the other end. Yeah. The, the one comment I'll make to that too, and and I, Supervisor King, I certainly understand the the concern there. Is the the one of the things we've had on our legislative priority for a long time is that the legislator legislature give counties equal taxing equal authorities taxing. to the to the cities and the towns and this is something that they've had for a long time and at, at least it's a step I you know to be honest with you I really don't know if this will pass or not but at the state level but it's a step mm. nothing venture, nothing yet. yeah subject C adopt a board of supervisors meeting policy move approval second have a motion and a second uh, and a discussion. Mr. Chair, I just want to again thank Carol and, and Ruth for some of the work that was done on this. This is a result of our discussion at the work session the other Friday and appreciate the, the comments on it. Right. How will we make this known? We will have it on the website. We will also provide this information as part of our agendas. Um, Ruth outside yeah we'll have it posted outside when people come in to sign in we'll have that posted out there as well so um, right okay and I, and I do I, I thank you and I do want to reiterate because I know more and more folks when they come for public address have asked in the past about the ability to make presentations um, presentations will need to be provided to the county before the meeting itself so that we have the opportunity not to screen it not to go through it but to make sure that it's not bringing viruses or other problems right. to the county systems um, and then Ruth and or Vicki will be more than glad to help folks when when they have that so but I appreciate the, the, the clarity on this one Okay, we have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gable? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. Subject D, amend Rule 17 of the Rules of Order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. Now it's time for the county attorney's report. Uh, no report, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. County administrator's report. Mr. Chair, I'm going to use some of the county attorney's time tonight. Uh, a couple of items that I wanted to bring to the board's attention. First, I wanted to share with you a copy of the 2014 annual report that is put together each year by our economic development folks. Um, this is a, a, a very nice document uh, that um, highlights some of the activities that have gone on in the county and, and uh, in economic development throughout the county for the past year. Uh, How did you manage to get on the cover? I don't. I, I really had nothing to do with that. I promise you. I, matter of fact, when I saw it, I told Charlie. I said, "Can't you find another picture?" But uh, that's actually it. that picture actually came from Tech Nine, and that is one of the things that gets us a lot of recognition each year is the RBC RBTC Tech Night event that we have each year. Um, and I, I'm going to ask Brian Hamilton to stand up because 
Um, I just I want to recognize Brian and, and Brenda and Charlie. Charlie Jewell is the primary architect of this document, but for the last year, um, economic development has been extremely busy with a number of projects. Uh, matter of fact, last summer and last fall, with all the challenges that we've had with the technology manufacturing building and, and securing two long-term tenants after Brian told me at least four or five times that there was no way we were going to be able to get both of them and I kept saying keep trying. Um, uh, they've really put in a lot of effort and I know that uh, I know that Brian has had a lot of stressful days and nights and some of them have caused me stressful days and nights too but um, I, I just want to recognize Brian and his staff for, for the job you've done over the past year. Um, And, and I will, I'm going to take, take from Supervisor Perkins, too. I, I, I am sorry that Angie and Mark got out of here before John, after John Aldridge's presentation because that's another group that's really busted their can over the last year. And one reason we get as good an audit as we do every year is because of their efforts. And um, we'll certainly share, share that with them. A couple of meetings. Um, we had a great uh, dedication at Auburn Middle School yesterday. Uh, appreciate the folks that were able to make it out for that. Uh, that's a beautiful facility. If you haven't been through it, you need to make time to go take a look. Uh, I think we're in good shape in Reiner for the future for, for schools. Um, uh, next, next stop's Christiansburg. <laughs> um, two meetings coming up that I wanted to make you aware of. Uh, we periodically have a meeting. There's a group that's meeting on passenger rail to the New River Valley. Uh, that committee's meeting next Tuesday over at uh, Radford, I believe, is where the next meeting is. Um, so looking forward to going over and hearing what progress has been made on that issue. Supervisor Biggs mentioned earlier that several of us will be in Richmond the end of next week attending VACO Legislative Day. Uh, trying to persuade our legislators uh, to do no harm <laughs> while they're there. Um, and along that line, I do want to mention, I mentioned at the work session a week ago Friday about uh, a bill that we had some concern about that Senator Carrico had, had sponsored and Delegate Rush had also sponsored regarding rename or designating the New River Bridge on I-81, the Trooper Andrew Fox Memorial Bridge had an opportunity to talk further with Senator Carrico and explain to him that this board did not have an objection to the naming of the bridge, but we had had a policy in the past that when groups or organizations came and uh, requested that roads or bridges be named, that that group, the group that requested it was also responsible for coming up with the funding for the signage and the way this the way this bill was written, it basically said Pulaski and Montgomery counties would be responsible for paying for the signage um, and suggested that perhaps there were other agencies or groups that might be willing to cover that. Well, he approached the Virginia State Troopers Association and the State Troopers Association is going to pay for the signage for both Pulaski and Montgomery County. So got that, you know, I just, that one really concern me because we have enough challenges with our budgets without having things put on us and I, you know I certainly have haven't had several folks that I've known over the years that lost their lives in law enforcement I certainly have a lot of respect for Trooper Fox and it had nothing to do with the issue other than we were being asked to pay for something that we didn't ask for um, Mr. Chair other than that that's all I had this evening well I looked at my looked at my my little list here. It's got like <clears throat> supervisor Tuck first, and I looked down and four. It's supervisor Tuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean you so important. You so you so important. You got you you on here twice. Yeah, and Todd's not even on there. <clears throat> okay. I must do it. I said enough. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should start with Supervisor King. Okay, we'll start with with, with uh, Supervisor King. <laughs> I don't have much, just uh, I appreciate being invited out to Auburn Middle School yesterday for the grand opening and I appreciate each one of y'all come out there and celebrate with us. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Biggs. 
Um, I appreciated it too, and I appreciated our chair's remarks. I thought they were well done. And um, I just have a couple things. Um, when I went to the library board, they were wanting to know where the library uh, strategic plan stands. I said, well, it's probably just standing somewhere. But anyway, they want us to keep that in mind because, you know, things are going to need to be done. And, of course, the things that need to be done cost money, and we don't have any money, but they just want to remind us, sort of like the Parks and Rec. So I'll just bring that to your attention. Um, dialogue on race. Um, that was last Saturday, a week ago, I guess. And, uh, the I 17th. Believe, yeah. Um, let's see, Mr. Brown was there, and... I was there, and, Matt, and was Matt was there, there, right? And Craig was there, right? I was there yeah. for most well, of it. Well, it was really interesting. I, I really, really, really liked the first part of that. The whole thing was well done, but the first part really intrigued me because they had Virginia Tech students that had gone to Ferguson and experienced some of the things that were going on there and came back to tell about it. And to hear it from a young person's viewpoint was very, very interesting. Um, Lots of uh, lots of people there. Um, good dialogue. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring to your attention is on Thursday, there's going to be a um, county school liaison meeting in the afternoon, and I got a note from over there if there's anything we want to put on the agenda to discuss. So if there's anything that you want discussed, the I, I, only thing I wrote down, I remember something about from our... Um, when we had the, our retreat, didn't we say something about trying to get a schedule of meetings? The, the fifth meetings. Monday. Yeah, they're trying to work on the fifth and Monday. We just need to ask to where they are on that yeah. because we've sent that to them but haven't heard back. So would that be something to ask on Thursday? Absolutely. Okay. All right. If you guys think of anything else, let me know. And that's it. Okay. Supervisor Perkins. I really don't have a report, but I do want to reiterate that I appreciate all that uh, Angie and and Mark and all their staff uh, do for us. Um, it's quite an undertaking, but you know I think this time the thing I noticed most of all is that they were saying um, that what they were doing was based on what their projections are, and that very little that they can tell us um, was the way it's going to finally end up. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, based on, on the way we uh, and what we have uh, currently. And um, in other words, it's going to go through three or four or more um, kinds of revisions based on what Ever the General Assembly does, and uh, and of course what we say to, and what the school board presents to us. So I thought it was very good that they were that most of the things that were up there, uh, you know, as far as uh, the uh, presentation was concerned, really involved. Um, this is our best guess at this time, and so and they do a really good job of thank that. you what and i appreciate that and what, whoever else works carol you well, <laughs> what what the county has control over we have a good feel for what we don't have control over which unfortunately is a whole lot right we just have to wait and see but uh yeah the, we have a great staff and carol is a key part of that too yeah that's what i was saying thank you that's all. Thank you. Mr. Gabriel. Um, skip. Okay. Um, two things I attended the dialogue on race uh, the other weekend. I thought that was a nice um, nice event. I look forward to, to seeing where that goes. Uh, also had an EDC meeting um, recently. Had a nice presentation from Virginia Community Capital mm -hmm. and all the good work that they're doing. Um, lots of uh, economic development uh, stuff going on, as you can see in the annual report. And there's even more coming into the new year. So. Um, um, I'm hopeful for the economic outlook going forward. And that's all. Mr. Creed. Yeah, I want to say just uh, one thing is that, uh, sorry I didn't get to, to the Auburn Schoolhouse event, and I was deadly rooting on one of our, <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of our not, 
so close uh, school, high school places, but Virginia Tech, they had a ball game. I absolutely had to go. <laughs> Good, they almost won. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, they weren't supposed to have a chance, and, and they put on a performance. And if they will play like that the rest of the year, they'll win the majority of their games going from here forward. So uh, I don't know whether they can get that much enthusiasm to win uh, going down the road or not. But uh, uh, I had already seen the school out there. I went uh, there twice uh, while they were making it. And it's uh, a very, very, very beautiful place. Uh, they, the windows and things, uh, I really liked how they matched them up with the old windows. Uh, did a wonderful job. Sorry I wasn't there, but uh, I couldn't turn it down. <laughs> That's <was> weak. <laughs> okay, Mr. Tuck, saving the best for last. I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, I put together a little PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> and I want to say this. I'm talking with you guys. I don't want to feel like I'm talking at you guys. But also, and I shared some of this during our, our, our retreat. And in doing so, I just want to also share this with the general public. And there's been so many things said about the pipeline and people being suspicious that we're trying to hide things from them. And so one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that we were talking about it and, and, and maybe talk about what we need to do in the future. Uh, I've had several people come to me and they, they've been critical. Why are you opposing this pipeline? And, and I've still yet to hear any economic benefit uh, to Montgomery County or even our, in Southwest Virginia. Uh, and that's why I've opposed it. Uh, and looking at this, it just doesn't make any economic sense. And, and it's potentially going to hurt us, not help us. And, and so that's why I've opposed it in the past. I, I've spent 30 minutes on the telephone with, with Morgan Griffin. And he indicated to me that none of this gas is staying in Southwest Virginia or in Virginia. It's, maybe in northern Georgia and, and other places, but not in Montgomery County. And, and looking at uh, some of the meetings that take place, this is one of my favorite quotes of Ronald Reagan, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Well, FERC yeah. came to town. <laughs> and in, in that meeting with FERC, uh, I waited in line to talk with them, and I know several of the supervisors, and, and Craig was there. And, and the FERC representative stated that FERC would not develop an alternative route. That that was either up to the company to come up with an alternative route or a stakeholder to submit an alternative route. Now that representative stated that if we want an alternative route, we needed to propose one. And that puts us in a, a difficult situation when you start thinking about where we are. And it's also one of my favorite cartoons growing up was, I'm just a bill. And, and y'all have probably been watching some of the things that have been going on in Washington. Um, Senator King co-sponsored a bill that would basically require the energy secretary uh, to act very quickly on some of the exportation of gas. Uh, you look at what the House of Representatives did. The House on Wednesday cleared legislation setting a, a one-year deadline for FERC to approve applications or deny applications, to trying to fast track. These are things that are going on around us. But other things that are going on around us, and, and you look at that, if you remember from that schoolhouse rock, it's just a bill. Now that still has to get through the Senate, and still has to, to get past a, a presidential veto potentially. But those are things that are going on around us. But also, as someone who's an attorney, I'm seeing folks from the in Mountain Valley Pipeline in the courthouse doing their title work there are surveys taking place. And when you start fast-tracking things and saying that, that maybe it's going to be a year and it's going to be approved, that means that maybe we need to start thinking about where we're, what we're going to do. I, I respect the folks that are absolutely opposed to the pipeline for a lot of different reasons. Uh, primarily, some of them are just saying, hey, look, I don't, I don't want this fracking gas to be coming out of West Virginia and being in chip. I, I think it's damaging the environment. That may not be our fight right now, but I, I respect the folks that are, that's their position. I understand where they're coming from. Um, there are a lot of battles that, where the, the little guy does win. Remember David and Goliath? Mm -hmm. And there's sometimes that there's some battles where 
the little guy stands on principle. And it, this is one of my favorite stories. It's about Masada. It's a, a the, the Jewish folks went up on this this one fort, and there was about 900 of them, and there was 16,000 Romans. You can see from the right hand side, the Romans laid siege to this place. And eventually, right when they were getting ready to break down the walls, the 900 committed suicide rather than go into slavery or be subject to torture of the Romans. They fought the good fight. And of course, remember the Alamo. Sometimes fighting the good fight is worth it. Proposing an alternative route. I've been thinking about it, and, and I sent out that email, and, and bounced ideas, and I want to thank Craig and Morgan for their responses. Sometimes you need, when you're bannering things around, you need somebody to say, hey, have you thought about some things? When we start talking about this, we could use our GIS system to look and, and to link up between different landowners. But remember what we were accusing and, and, and talking about Mountain Bible and Pipeline did. They just took a, a line and drew it. They didn't look at some of the geological impacts that it might have. They didn't look to see that they were basically going through a subdivision. They just followed that power, power line. And so we would be guilty if we just simply did that of some of their, the, the exact same sins that we accused them of. We as a county government lack expertise on this. We don't have the time to obtain experts to be able to develop a detailed alternative route. We don't have geologists on staff. We don't have structural and mechanical engineers. We don't have surveyors. It's not practical in many ways for us to come up with that. We could have the staff speak with FERC and determine how detailed an alternative route they need for FERC to consider. This is something I think we should look at and talk with them about because maybe we can talk with them and say if you would would you consider a proposal that would go in a more northeasterly direction that would stay in the national forest maybe link up with the power line that is already existing over in craig county and instead of going through preston forest and going through a lot of areas gary was describing earlier to me today they've got more houses in it than, than preston forest does down in his district the other thing we could do is we could try to work with Mountain Valley Pipeline to work on an alternative route. Um, that is something that, do we think about doing that? They do have engineers. They do have for folks who are surveying. They do have people who are in our area at this point in time. If we do work with Mountain Valley Pipeline, we're doing so on behalf of our fellow citizens. And we're working to try for an alternative with the least impact on Montgomery County. But in my opinion, if we do that, we should try to get as much as we possibly can from Montgomery County citizens because we're the ones who are going to be having to live with this thing for decades from now. Now, you've heard me when they first talked about that. This is the gas pipeline that runs through my parents' property where I've grown up. I've hunted on this land. You can see that periodically there's posts like this, and this is typical with gas transmission lines. And you can see where this comes out of Tennessee. And, and you look at it and you say, you, you can kind of see the road there, that's dirt road that we use for hunting, um, but there's a wide path that you could use for a lot of different things. Um, perhaps we ask for greenways, and this is looking in the other direction. Um, there's a lot of wildlife that does come on these areas. Perhaps this would be a great way to do some bike trails, hiking trails, things like that, to try to, and, and make Mountain Valley agreed to maintain these things. That might be something that we consider. If we do work with Mountain Valley, some folks are going to view our efforts as, as just giving our approval and saying, hey, look, we, we agree with this pipeline. But so far, every single board member that I've talked to is in opposition to the pipeline. But we're all struggling with a, a very difficult situation that's been put in front of us. But my last slide is something that I, I want y'all to think about also. If the gas does come out, you know, it doesn't come out by pipeline, it's going to come out by rail. And if it comes out by rail, you think about going well, right down through downtown Christiansburg, but you'll know, also think about our neighbors. Those rails go right through Salem, right through Roanoke, right through Roanoke City. Um, the, the, the line on the right hand side is the old Virginia line. That goes underneath the Huckleberry Trail, goes under 460. Many people don't know that there's railroad tracks underneath 460. There's a tunnel. It goes down in Ellet Valley near the country club. And so you, you've heard about the things that have happened in Canada, the major explosions. You had the situation that happened out in Lynchburg. Uh, so there's some dangers 
uh, about transport by rail. Um, tonight, I would just ask if we could ask staff to reach out to FERC to try to get a better idea of what would need to be done in an alternative plan. Not to say we're going to come up with it, but at least to have the staff start looking. Because if FERC says, well, you've got to come up with this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, then that may not be a practical solution, and we may not be able to come up with it. But at least we'll be operating with knowledge. Um, and, and like I said, I, I respect y'all's opinions. I know that there's some of you that are diametrically opposed to it for some really good reasons, and, and I respect that. But that, that's my statement. That's my board report, and I'm happy to talk about it and sit back up there with the rest of y'all. Okay, we can open up some discussion if you want to. Go ahead, Mr. Craig. Yeah, I, I've, I've got a couple of things, and Chris and I have talked for a little bit about it before, before we got into session. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we sent, we, well, we received some email from our county and administrator stating that uh, they've already given us some different routes. I, I looked at that map, Gary. I don't think that that's a detailed map. I think they just kind of put it up there. I don't. I saw what you were talking about, and I'm not certain it was the information I forwarded. It, it did, but it had uh, in your district. It does look like it changes a little bit, but it it's it not a very mine a whole lot. It, it but it doesn't look like a detailed map to me. I would want to see much more detail than that because it, was, it still it looks was like much more detailed than this first map was. Much more. Well, it was a matter of fact, you know, you're drawn in a small pencil line and not a wide eraser line. So it's just what we got. I do know. I, I do know that I've heard from the public relations person that's working with the group that they're continuing to, as he says, refine the route. Um, now I know we also had asked that they come periodically to update right. us and the last that we talked we were going to try to have them come to the second february meeting to give us an update now i haven't got that that was the discussion and they seem to be amenable to that but that's not been confirmed yet for the second meeting so one thing we can certainly ask when they come is if they have any updates from what we've talked about previously let's make sure we're clear so what about uh, telling them to places where we don't want it, like through Preston Pines, densely populated neighborhoods and things like this, and as opposed to trying to define a route form, um, I see this as that, okay, if it's going through Gary's yard, and I'm not worried about it, but if you talk to Gary, and the next thing you know, you put it in my yard, then I'm going to be pissed off about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and exactly. so, you, you, it's, a, it's a situation you, you can't win in. Right. You know, especially if, you, if, if the county proposes a route that wasn't even considered or whatever. But I, I think I would go about it. We oppose the, the route through residential neighborhoods, it need to be densely populated neighborhoods and let them pick out where they're going to move it to, you know. Well, I, I rode with a gentleman last week, actually Monday, Sunday, Saturday, he'd been in New York, he was up there seeing how many boats he can get to go whichever way he wants to go. Uh, we rode for a little over six hours. Uh, and I purposely took him by up into some different hollows and things that would make for a better place for about anybody because there's nothing there. Uh, and went over to Blacksburg Country Club and told him he thought he had a, a big bell ringing over in Preston Forest. He better get his wagon ready if he come down there uh, <laughs> and started 
saying he's going to put them down on the Blackbird Country Club because that mountain down there is absolutely full of people. I mean, there's all kinds of houses in that place down there. If you go down and just spend a little bit of time, you know, you'll see uh, one of the first parts has got. And it goes that way all the way out to the old cheese factory and back up to Blacksburg on the, on the, on the back side. So, you know, he needs to get away from, from, from those. That's uh, Miss Perkins' territory and, and those. There's a lot of people down there. I mean, just a whole lot of them. And this new thing that, and I didn't bring it with me, but uh, that we received, I thought was from Greg, and I still think that I thought. It was an email, is it the email dated December, or the economic benefits of Mountain Valley Pipeline in Virginia yeah. dated December? It was their study, not our study. It's, yeah, it's, it's uh, their information yeah. that he forwarded right. to us. Yeah, I forwarded that out earlier today when I was mm -hmm. going back looking through information tonight I thought they had sent that directly to y'all in December and I didn't ever see any evidence that they had so it was, no, we hadn't it it was oh, something okay. in the newspaper well, this, published this in the is newspaper. completely different especially when you get down to places I know something about but I'm around Lafayette and, and Alliston uh, they have moved it to, uh, a good thousand fifteen hundred feet away from the river on the other side and there's nothing over there but farmland and it goes and hits instead of coming back on Montgomery County side it goes across the river and the railroad tracks and comes in on the right on the uh, road side according to those pictures that are in there so it's a win-win for the people down there that don't want it I mean that's they don't have any danger I had a, a, a rental house down there that Otherwise, would have showed like it might be leaving. But uh, according to this new thing, it, it's, there's no danger whatsoever. Gary, are you talking about figure number one on the executive summary where the, at that map? Is that we the had map? three, there was three of them sent. I don't have, I can't get to it from here, but was that was information that they had sent to us, I guess it was in early December, related to their economic study. Um, and like I said, when I was looking at that, because I was... And it broke down how much money the county would get. Which we're having a really hard time proving. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's what these things I know. are saying. Out of those three, one of them dealt with how much money the county would get. And it would it should get about a million dollars, a million and a half thousand Property dollars tax. if it stayed where it was at. But by moving and going and coming down through Roanoke, then Roanoke was going to get a little more and we was going to get a little less. How, how would we get that money? What, what well, would that come from? The, the study says that it will come from assessment on the value of the pipeline that passes through the county right. in terms of property tax. And that's assessed by the State Corporation Commission and then uh, reimbursed or you know, passed on to the county. But as Carol and I were talking earlier today, the we're having a really tough time trying to figure out how they've arrived at that figure because so it does. The corporation it, might be overinflating that figure. Yeah, it could be. Yes, possibly. Possibly. So it, it gave a figure for for all the all the states that it came from. I read it as self-serving for the. For the <laughs> I, 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 I mean, and, I, and if you haven't, if you haven't got that, you ought to get it. At least look at it. Yeah. Because. Yeah, well, I, I, when that study first came out, we got a couple of calls, and my comment to that at that time was that information was put together by the pipeline company right. and an independent consultant, and, I mean, if there's any questions about it, they need to be referred to them. You know, as we get more concrete information about the details of the pipeline, we can start if you will, nailing down some of those assumptions, but you know that that, that number looks extremely high to me. Did any of them have a date on when they sent? Them? On when they sent the, the, the three pieces of. Well, they released that on December the tenth. This one that was, I think it that's was right. That's a disclaimer on it too. We got the information. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and like I said, when I was going back through that information today, I thought that they had already sent that to y'all. That's why I wanted to make sure you had it. Well, that, it was a completely different thing from anything we had before, and it, it held true. Well, and that was prepared, that most of that, I think most, if not all, of that information that I forwarded today was prepared by an independent consultant hired by Mountain Valley Pipeline. Mm -hmm. and Bill, I, I like a, a lot of what you said about trying to to, to get with potentially and, and maybe talk with them, um, but it, and at, at, like I said, at the same time, I'd like to find out if. FERC wants us to come out and say, okay, you're going through the Nets property, yes, but you're not going through Craig, and, and this is where, that's one thing, that's probably way too much detail, mm -hmm. but if FERC says, if you go in a northeasterly direction and you're maintaining the national force before going in, and that's good enough for them, mm -hmm. I'd like to know that, how much information FERC requires, that's a, and then I'm looking at what you're saying as, as maybe the best option is to work with the company to see if we can avoid some of the more populated areas and knowing that uh, I don't support this pipeline. Well, I, th I think too is that FERC itself won't uh, as much cooperation. I mean, they want to prove what they're going to prove anyway, but I think they like to see a lot of cooperation before it even gets to them for them to make the approval. I think they would like to have some, some, some pluses from their point of view where the counties that we're going through is is working with us and 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 doing things like this so it makes their decision i guess uh a little bit more palatable to for them you know instead of everybody's opposed no cooperation no nothing and they make this decision to grant that permit and it makes them really look like the really bad guys so uh cooperation is good but what scares me uh, 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 I don't have a problem meeting with them and, and saying that, hey, you're coming right through Preston Forest. Uh, we're really opposed to you coming through Preston Forest. And for an example, if you're going through the country club down there, we're really opposed to that and not say, put it over here. Let them figure out where they need to put it. And uh, because uh, when you mess with people's property, I mean, you get some people very angry at you. And uh, and you know, I, I've been, as I told you before, I had my grandparents' house was taken, um, the house I was daycare. That's why I was still thinking that having it stay in the National Forest for a longer period of time, <laughs> if this is a nat if this is going to benefit our nation, perhaps some of the National Forest ought to be set aside and then try to make the best out of it that we possibly can. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I like you presentation and, and, and so forth as far as uh, greenways and trails and things like that is is I think the bottom line when it comes down to it it's going to come through it's going to but 99.99 percent it's going to be a gas line through this county okay how can we uh, mitigate it some to so it doesn't impact us uh, so much uh, is what I'm sort of looking for. Get what you can out of them. Uh, have the least impact on the, the densely populated sections of the county. Uh, but let them be the one to go to Mr. Jones and says, well, we're moving the line from over here. We'd like to look at your property or something like that. Don't say, well, Montgomery County uh, directed us over and suggested that we, we do this. Well, this guy's going to be pissed off at the pipeline people and doubly pissed off at us mm -hmm. for suggesting something like that. Yeah. Uh, Bill, are you thinking that we, at some point in time, not deciding tonight, but maybe at their next meeting, decide to designate two, two of us to go meet with the pipeline people? If, uh, what, I'm, what I'm thinking too is that the last time we we uh, got an update from the pipeline people and basically you know uh, they were reminded that you wasn't going to come here and meet with us like our November 5th meeting or whatever it was and not come to this board periodically to keep us up to date on what you're doing 
and that's when uh, like maybe the second February meeting come up and because I guess we met with him a couple weeks ago or something and it's oh yeah 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 we'll, we'll be here and things like that now would the February meeting be too far off to well, that's meeting after next yeah meeting so after next to, 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 to bring these folks and then yeah. try to figure out where we're at yeah to come in and it gives us all a little bit of a shot at them they would be under our presentations and mm -hmm. and whatever so it's different than public address they would give it give us the opportunity to ask questions and and uh, make suggestions and, and whatever at them and then it's it's a uh, more uh, I guess public and it's mm -hmm. not like we're yeah. hiding anything yeah. or suggesting anything and, and I just worry that, that I don't want to see too much time, and then next thing you know, by not doing anything, by not taking any action, we've already picked action. action. Yeah, yeah. And Inaction is no action. action. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What do you think, Annette? Because you you, you got a chunk of paper. Yeah, you got a chunk of paper. Um, Gary's got. I have no problem with uh, you know meeting the whoever we, we choose to meet with with them. I just know that FERC said, and I was right there when the gentleman said to me, well, nobody, you know, uh, nobody has offered us an alternative. And until we do, we're not going to, um, you know, we're not going to change. And Mary was right there with me, and Mary said, uh, or she was behind me after I said this, and um, and he said it to me, and I said, but we don't have that kind of expertise. I mean, that would be like mm -hmm. us doing exactly what right. Mountain right. Valley did. Um, and I really can't say, okay, let's just take it and move it over two streets in Preston Forest. That's not right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, so my whole feeling is I don't want... I don't want to particularly be seen as really trying to negotiate with, you know, Mountain Valley. But what I see us doing is finding a way to talk to those Mountain Valley people to say, and I think Chris said this, uh, uh, let's talk about what we don't like about the way it is, Right. and then can you help us go, where are you? Uh, with going through the the forest, where are you with uh, altering the the uh, pipeline uh, uh, proposed pipelines route, um, so that we can understand better about not going through people's you know yards. I don't care if it's in Preston Forest, if it's down where Gary is. I mean, going through people's homes is wrong. Well, the thing about it, when you're saying having them help us, I, I, I really watch it or because... Or us help them. They, uh, well, I them just mean help to help us, us to understand, yeah. but not to draw a line. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Okay, Mary. Okay, well, when I was there at the same meeting that Chris and Annette and everybody was at, um, I talked to one of the officials from the pipeline company, and he says, well, even as we meet tonight, um, different routes are being drawn. I'm like, okay, even as we're meeting tonight, <laughs> different routes are being drawn, right. but you filed the one you filed, and so all these people are upset, and you're gonna keep them upset even though you're looking at different ways? I'm not understanding this. He goes, what well, changes all the time? Well, what I would like to know, I agree with Bill, I think they come here we asked them, okay, mm -hmm. what are these different routes that were alluded to at the open house? Have you really looked at any? Because I, to me, I just don't understand why you can't get answers from them. And I also agree with, and Chris, I'm glad that you put in your uh, presentation tonight, we do not have the expertise to be going and drawing lines. Right. When they were supposedly at the expertise, they didn't even Google down to googlemaps.com to see that Preston Forest was there where the line was. I mean, so I think that, you know, I don't want to get into the situation where we're saying, oh, don't put it here, put it over there. Um, but I, you know, I would like to know what it is they're looking at. And I don't well, think it's fair to, but see, they don't operate the same way I'm thinking. But my point to him was, 
you've got all these people all upset because you put it through this this development, but yet you're telling me as we meet tonight, you're looking at different routes. See, I have a disconnect there. Well, it is because they haven't come back to to tell us yeah, I need at to know. anything at all about their different routes. That's what I'm saying. To help us understand what they're doing, why we don't like what it is, reiterate that, and then say, okay, you know, if you are drawing alternate routes, where are they going? Need to update us. I mean, yeah. just like yeah, we're yeah, sitting right. here talking about about something, and and they may have moved where they had planned to go through, you know, three or four hundred yards over that way. Yeah. But we don't know that. And yeah. the, and the and the, I guess the people uh, whose property involved, uh, they don't even know what needed because if I go on your property to survey it and look at no, it and do geology, uh, the, uh, <laughs> geological reports and things like this, and then we look at the map, then we go over here and move it. Uh, I, I would say it's like a, a, a floating, mm -hmm. the way they talk, as as we talk, we're drawing, what they say, we're drawing different routes, different routes different now. Routes. As, so, as we meet tonight. As we meet tonight. So. <laughs> Um, well, I think they were saying that just so they could back us off for a little while. I mean, I don't mean to be ugly about them, but I mean, I just think it was to say, yes, we know that you don't really want to go through mm -hmm. us to go through where it is, and you're opposed to it. Well, we're drawing, diff we're looking at different routes, or we're drawing different routes, or <coughs> we're doing something. But but if they could, I mean, if if we go out and we say as we propose a a, a alternate route, so to speak. And then uh, they get to say to FERC, oh, yeah, we went to Montgomery County and the Board of Supervisors recommended and supported this route, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, and you then the, the rest yeah. of our constituents is going to uh, run us from out of the county. We might oh, be the Board of Supervisors. You know, there is another power line about yeah. five miles outside of Montgomery County that runs through the National Forest over in Craig County. Mm -hmm. And then that power line goes through a very unpopulated area. And so when I'm saying alternative routes, there may be, maybe it comes through Giles, then cuts over through the National Forest, and then heads over to Craig County. Mm -hmm. But instead of being in the National Forest for two roughly miles, or whatever it is currently, that would mean seven or eight miles that's going to be in the National Forest. But that's why I'm saying green if light, bike ways. Right. Yeah. But, it, but if that is that kind of, can we do that general term to FERC? And they'll say, okay, that is an alternative possibility here or will FERC say no you're, you've got to give us a, a, a closer line well we you know we we're never going to be able to do that we're never going to be able to know All right the, mm -hmm. and, and but that's why I was saying if we could get some basic information from FERC what they would consider uh, okay. but if you look on Google Maps there is this power line that you see comes out of West Virginia <laughs> goes straight through Craig County uh, then goes down into Roanoke County um, and, and now that's me looking around on, and, and talking with some folks. It is there. It's about five or six miles on in you know past where they're talking about Preston Forest, roughly. Well, didn't they? It wasn't there a portion of the article in the newspaper that said the Forest Service mm -hmm. was yeah. talking with these people mm -hmm. to try to decide whether or not it was what they really wanted? Well, the that's two federal agencies that are going to be talking with them. You know, one that gives approval and the other one that's just giving approval to go through the National Forest. Um, I, I just think that somehow or other we've got to have an update. I think somehow or other we've got to find out from the relevant people, whether it's FERC or the power line. Well, the, the, I think the thing this conversation have drawn to, do we wait to the second February meeting to get an update yeah, or do we I'm try to encourage some kind of meeting before. I like waiting to the, the the last second meeting in February for the simple reason it's not two people meeting with them. Okay. This is uh -huh. just the entire right. board uh -huh. and, right. and uh, everybody's uh -huh. up to date and, and he said, she said, you know, right. we're talking about reporting and things like that. Would you have a problem with Craig or Marty reaching out to FERC to see if how what we have would have to propose to be considered an alternate plan? But yeah, we don't I, don't, I mean, if that's not too much trouble for them and well, if FERC would talk to them. Well, but, 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 but that goes to us proposing an alternate plan. Is that what we're saying we want to do? It's I'm getting information. It's I'm, just I'm getting information. I just want information. At this yeah. point in uh -huh. time, all I want is information because what if we said, it doesn't go through Shawsville anymore. It doesn't go through Preston Forest. Maybe it goes through the National Forest yeah. over Craig County. Mm. Well, it never has gone through Shawsville. 
or not Charles, Charles will just Lafayette. Charles F. Lafayette, I apologize. Well, I just, I think that we don't want to do anything that would do anything to indicate that we are proposing about you know some kind of thing I don't know how you would um, word a letter to FERC or to anybody else to make certain that you know what are their what are the parameters for an alter right? to to sort of make sure that 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 we're in agreement to wait to the second uh, February meeting for an update. Let's, okay, then won't nobody leave your man, you know. Yeah. No, I'm okay on that. No. Oh, and on top of that, if everybody didn't get a copy of that, what was sent out, whether it was short or long, mm -hmm. we need to look at that. Everybody needs to be able to look at that stuff that I looked at today because that. I really like what I saw, what it looked like. And again, that, that information that I sent out today was prepared by a consultant for well, the gas company. That's right. That's letters? right. Because they published it in a newspaper, and, and some reporter wanted comments, and you didn't have time to even study oh, I to look at it. We didn't even, didn't even comment on it because when it hit the and then when I yeah but when I read, read it the first thing I'm sitting there saying well this is self-serving for the for the gas company can we talk about the letters maybe at the front? well I'm just saying I, I, does anybody have any problems with him writing a letter just to, to or, or contacting FERC or, or having Marty look get into it to just find out information not to propose any other routes just to find out what it takes to come up with an alternative route. But why they, are we you know, asking? Really gonna answer. Well, what I, what I thought might answer you, but Mount Valley would. That's all I want yeah. is FERC, because yeah. that's who, who's going to issue and the And what I'd like to them. ask if, if the board has some interest in that is that either Marty or I be, that, that you're okay with us making a call to FERC uh, writing a letter, I, to be yeah, candid with you, I don't know that we'll ever <laughs> see it. Yeah. And yeah. Just making and a call and having a general yeah. conversation yeah. with someone and then we can report yeah. back. Not to propose an alternate route, but just to say if the county's interested in getting comments to you about the proposed route, what are you looking for and how would you suggest that we bring information to you and just see what they say. Mm -hmm. I like to call better than a letter. If you were to call, like we're in bad shape or no, we need to know because some of us are about to get hurt. <laughs> I think a call is fine. If you yeah. word it like that. If, okay. Well, yeah, we will word it that way. I, I think that's the way it should uh, be. I think that's the way we uh, Anything talk. else, Chris? No, sir. Well, Sorry. since you since you used up my time, I, I, I don't have a report. We adjourn. That's a very good presentation. Chris. Thank you. Mm -hmm.